G'day, Chris here, and welcome back to Clickspring. Ever since getting into clockmaking, I've been obsessed with a particular style of horological engraving. It's that free-flowing scroll work that can be found on many high-quality English watches from the 18th century. To me, it's absolutely stunning, and something that I very much wanted to learn how to do. Now, not long after starting the Antikythera Mechanism project, I started researching the Layout Line Fragments video and doing a little test engraving for the Antikythera dials. It was my first step into the world of engraving and fairly straightforward cutting, but it did get me started on handling the tools, so I figured I might as well push on properly and see where it takes me. So I bought some books and DVDs, put in quite a bit of time, and here we are. Now there are a lot of things about getting started on learning to engrave that I found confusing. It turns out that it's all relatively straightforward, but it's not easy to figure out the really fundamental stuff on your own. And I suspect that this probably puts more than a few people off from having a go. So that's what this video is all about. A bit of detail from my perspective as a beginner that hopefully demystifies a few things and makes it easier to take the plunge. As always, take what works for you and simply turf the rest. Okay, so the big question for most of us starting out is what tools do I need to get started? And the good news is you don't need much at all and certainly not the power tools. A chasing hammer, a couple of gravers, a diamond hone and slipstone and an optivizer is enough to get started. And in fact, it's enough to go all of the way to doing completely professional work. Along with a very simple work holding setup, this is what I used for the first three months. Just laying down practice cuts and trying not to make too much of a mess. Now I do like the quick change feature on these GRS gravers, but other than that, they're not a lot different from the gravers that you've seen me using on the lathe. So the cutting tools at least are definitely something that you can knock up yourself to save on the dollars. At this point, I hadn't yet purchased a ball vise and it wasn't really something that I missed. I had no trouble holding the work on this leather pad and on occasion using my engineer's vise because the most important thing at this point is to get started making basic practice cuts. And if, like me, you're not one of those people who can naturally sketch well, in the midst of all of this practice cutting, something becomes abundantly clear. The focus needs to shift onto the one tool that really matters the most. This one. Now don't let this bit scare you off. The sketch does play a big role in the outcome, but it turns out that scroll drawing is very much a rules-based activity, and absolutely anybody can learn those rules. Of course, there are many people who are in a much better position to teach you those rules than I am, so I'm going to point you to the same books and DVDs that I used. But the thing I can add at this point is to say don't be discouraged by this part of the learning process. I'd never done any sketching prior to this, and I found it to be a real uphill climb in the beginning. But the books and DVDs are outstanding, and admittedly I was coming off a fairly low base, but it was a genuine shock to see how quickly things started to improve. It really is a case of putting in the time and repetition. Eventually, the rest will take care of itself. Okay, so why is the sketch so important? Well, first of all, because this is where all of the technical aspects of the composition are decided. Where to place the shading. What elements can reasonably overlap the others. Misshapen curves can be corrected and unbalanced areas of the design can be identified and then changed. I'm sure there's something to be said for cutting even a poor design into metal, if only for the cutting practice. But personally, I benefited more from working on getting the drawings into the best possible shape that I could manage. For me, that meant breaking a design down and concentrating on each single element to really get a grip on what makes each one work before committing to larger compositions. Now, in addition to solving the structural issues, sketching also trains an ability to develop a clear mental picture of what you're going to cut. It's not easy to represent engraved lines with paper and pencil. In fact, it's often just a loose suggestion of where the cuts need to go, with the expectation that things will be tightened up considerably when the graver hits the metal. It also becomes clear when you transfer artwork to a workpiece that it's all downhill in terms of resolution and clarity, particularly if the work is finely detailed. What was once clear now has to be inferred from a rough outline. A reliance on a clear mental picture of where the cuts need to go now becomes essential, and sketching practice is where that picture is developed and embedded.
So I spent roughly one hour per day on sketching practice for the first six months, and I did almost no metal cutting beyond just the simple practice cuts during that time. I did have a crack every now and then at a few of the small elements that I was sketching, but it was clear to me that I needed to get better at sketching, so that's where I spent most of my practice time. One thing that Ron Smith mentions in his books that I've found to be hugely helpful is to sketch well oversize. At a minimum, I sketch at least double, but often 10 times or more of the natural engraved size of the work. This makes it much easier to capture detail and pick up mistakes and correct them. On occasion, I'd put in a whole day of drawing. So all up, I guess that I spent about 200 hours of drawing practice before I really started on doing any sort of serious cutting. Now when I say serious, I'm still only talking about scrap practice plates. Brass is a terrific metal to work with. It's as soft as butter and you can really enjoy making quick progress. And of course, it all starts out hideously rough in the beginning. But slowly some control starts to creep in and before long, things start to improve. The practice plates are also a great way to work through any execution problems as a step up from sketching. Like for example, I use this practice plate to work out how to make some of the cuts for the card press project. As you can see, not the whole thing, but just the bits and pieces that were causing a problem. I wasn't happy that I was seeing these particular elements clearly enough, so I ran through them a few times on the practice plate as a sort of study until I was happy to commit to the actual workpiece. I'm essentially doing the same thing with the practice plates in this video. You've probably recognised that these are designs that I ended up using for the Byzantine sundial calendar. Aside from the general practice that they provide, it's nice to be able to trap any unforeseen design errors in a place where they just don't matter before committing to the final workpiece. If it was something that I could conveniently get to, then I would definitely have started with one of the short training courses from either GRS or the many other training providers. But I live in a fairly remote part of the world, so for me it has to be books and DVDs, as well as the close examination of the work of others, which I'll cover in a moment. Now of course, there's a lot to learn, but the two things that stand out to me is worth focusing on the most at the start are tool geometry and how to correctly form it when sharpening the gravers, and how to draw and compose designs. Everything else pretty much follows naturally as you get into it, but I regularly find myself revisiting these two topics and digging deeper to find out more. I'll provide links to the books and DVDs that I'm learning from, but there are many others too, so be sure to mention your own suggestions in the comments below. Now you're also going to get an excellent head start if you join the appropriate professional body you get access to the people who know exactly how to answer your questions, and they generally have the best training material too. A good example is the Firearms Engravers Guild of America. Amongst the many things they do for the industry, they publish an excellent quarterly magazine, chock full of information and full colour pictures, which are priceless for learning. And one thing I really like is their online catalogue of resin castings from master engravers it's incredibly helpful to be able to study the work from the world's best. So as much as the old school tools will get the show on the road, there's absolutely no doubt that the modern powered engraving tools make life so much easier, particularly if the work area is large. In general, not only does power engraving make things happen faster, but it reduces fatigue and massively accelerates the learning process because so much more cutting can be done in any given time frame. Now having said that, there's a definite skill in controlling the power tools well. It might not be as difficult to master as say a chasing hammer, but it does take a bit of time to get the hang of it. And this is where I think starting on the hand tools really pays off. The handpiece is a reciprocating air tool that mimics the hammer. Basically it's a small jackhammer. Knowing the feel of an actual hammer on the cutting tool, in particular how the rate and heaviness of the hip interact, help me to understand how to set up the machine correctly for different types of cutting. 
watching the tooltip behavior up close when slowly tapping by hand helped me to understand why certain things were happening with the much faster power tool. And having practiced a bit of push engraving, as often as not, I have the machine turned off for fine shading to really get the lightest cut. So the hand tool experience sort of sits underneath as a bit of base knowledge. As to the gear itself, I have a Gravermark AT with a Monarch handpiece, a standard engraver's ball on a satellite turntable, a power hone sharpening tool, and a Leica A60 bench microscope all of which I've sourced from GRS Tools. Now I have no affiliation at all with GRS, but I'm very happy to say that these tools are superb. All of the specs are available on their website, but if you'd like to know anything additional, just pop a question in the comments below. And there are of course several competing technologies, so be sure to check out the others too. Now the downside of course is that they're eye-wateringly expensive machines. I'll let you check out the numbers in your own currency, but make sure you're sitting down when you do. And not to labour the point too much, but if ever there was a reason to start out on the hand tools, then this would surely be it. So to summarise, as much as the power tools are fast and fun to use, a hammer, some gravers, simple sharpening tools and an optivizer will easily cover occasional use and certainly get things started. In all likelihood, it'll form the bedrock of your engraving knowledge and set you up for whatever comes next. But if you're inclined to a larger volume of work, or if the idea of the power tools just simply appeals, then you're going to love working with these machines. Anyway, that's about it for now. Links below, and be sure to shoot me any questions in the comments. Thanks for watching. I'll see you later.